Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 40. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue... Two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, for God is not a God of disorder but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. We have spent the summer in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. We have learned that the church, as Christ's body, is the extension of Jesus himself. Jesus' ministry is a ministry of words and works. He speaks and he does. And the church as his body and the gifts which he has given to the church are simply given that the ministry of Jesus on earth might be extended. His is the one essential ministry, the ministry of Jesus. As we have looked, especially at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we have seen that 1 Corinthians 12 describes the unity of the church in the midst of its diversity of operation. 1 Corinthians 13 describes the love that is to characterize the church And the emphasis of 1 Corinthians 14 is on building the church up. The passage today corrects two extremes. On the one hand, spiritual anarchy, where everybody does their own thing. And on the other hand, spiritual oligarchy, which is just a few doing the work of ministry. Paul is seeking some organization in the Corinthian church. Organization is a wonderful thing. It can be a bad thing. Nothing is more organized than a graveyard. And nothing is more dead. Church can be organized, but that doesn't mean it's alive. Paul is calling in this passage, first of all, in verse 26, for an involvement of every member in the life of the church. While I was on vacation, I heard a minister who was back in the pulpit, having just returned from vacation, saying that he had been to a church in Northern California. And after worship, as he was leaving the sanctuary, he noticed their marquee on the outside said something like this, Ministers. Every member. Assistants. And then we're given the names of the pastoral staff. I sort of like that. That's what Paul is getting at in verse 26 of chapter 14, that we're all to see ourselves as ministers. As we look at a passage like verse 26, about coming together and everyone having a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation, it's quite obvious that we're looking at a church where their worship services had a great deal more individual initiative and participation on the part of every member than perhaps, for example, our worship service this morning. What should we say about verse 26 in reference to how the Lord leads in our worship services today? I think we ought to avoid two errors. One is the error of seeing this verse as regulative for all Christian worship. That is, whenever Christians gather together, they've sort of got to sit in Quaker style until someone begins to move in one of these areas. 1 Corinthians 14 26 is a statement of fact. It describes how the Corinthians worship. But it is not a command. That is, it is not a command that whenever you worship, you must worship this way. There are other kinds of church worship described in the New Testament. Worship settings that are familiar, for example, to the one that we're worshiping in. The strong, independent spirit of the Corinthians had worked against a development of effective effective. Uh, pastoral leadership within the church and permitted a tremendous degree of, uh, of individual initiative which at times was not flowing in a controlled order that, that is wanted by the Spirit. So on the one hand, we don't necessarily need to see 1 Corinthians 14, 26 as regulative for all Christian worship. 
I think that its principal application today, in terms of every one of us contributing, best takes place in the context of our home Bible study groups. If, for example, the early church in Jerusalem, when it grew in the first few months to 10,000 people, had literally, every time they all gathered together for worship, carried out 1 Corinthians 14.26, and everyone had a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation, the meeting would still be going on 2,000 years later. So at some point in the road, there is a diversity even within worship style. I think the second error, though, that we must avoid is the error of seeing this verse as a museum display for early Christian worship, and then we never use it ourselves. And of course, again, I think the effective use of verse 26 especially comes within the home group setting. But the elements of worship that are being described in verse 26 are meant to characterize all Christian worship, whatever style uh, it has. For example, each one of you has a hymn. That is to say that the initiation of worship ought to be with singing and praise. A hymn can be something uh, in the New Testament times, an Old Testament psalm that is put to music, or it can be someone that week having a fresh revelation from the Lord and a, and a new song has been written. It could be therefore a psalm or a freshly composed song. Singing begins Christian worship. That's why when we start out, we don't all read in unison from the hymnal page. Reading is a wonderful thing, but a hymn involves the soul in a unique way that just simply language spoken doesn't involve the soul. God wants us to begin with praise. A lesson should characterize Christian worship. This is where there is a moment in a worship service or in a small group setting where we have a practical application of the Word of God to everyday life. We all need to know how to wrestle with life's practical dilemmas and opportunities. And so drawing the Word of God into that situation gives us a lesson. There ought to be a revelation. Now a lesson is by and large drawn from practical living or drawn from the study of the Word, systematic study of the Word. I think a revelation comes more through prayer and through a meditativeness before the Lord. That suddenly we receive an insight from the Spirit. It is a revelation. A vision, if you will. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that he abounds in revelations. We get an idea of what a revelation is like when we open the book of Revelation and find that John on the island of Patmos has a, a revelation of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of history in a time when a lot of Christians were wondering if the Lord had deserted His throne. A number of years ago now, I guess it was several years ago, while at a communion time, I remember while we were in a, a prayer in the congregation, suddenly I had this revelation of finding myself at the, at the consummation of communion, the banquet table of the Lord, the married supper of the Lamb. And I saw myself in a, in a large palatial banquet hall. It was vast. The table just spread and spread and spread. And yet it seemed small and intimate, although I knew it was huge and, and the tables were many and long. And I remember that we were all coming into the banquet hall to take our seats at the table and let the Lord lift the cup of communion with which to consummate all of this which we have looked forward to. And uh, as I pulled up my chair, I could not help noticing the other people that were coming to the tables. And I know in heaven, we're, theologically, I guess we're all to be dressed in white, right? Isn't the saints are dressed in white, is what Revelation says. But somehow that had been laid aside in the vision. And everybody was coming in the clothes of their country and climate. And what really struck me as I approached that table was the fact that there were most of the people that were coming to that table were in peasant garb or in prison uniform. It really gave me an insight into the meaning of the universal body of Christ and the fact that when we gather for communion, it's just not us gathering in this moment of time, but it's us gathering with the whole church of all the ages that there will be at one time when all the church will come together back in one room, just like it began in a room with 120. There will be a time when we all come back together from all places, all times, and we'll celebrate together with the Lord. It's a revelation, not a lesson, a revelation. There ought to be, Paul says, a tongue with interpretation. And, and we remember that a tongue is an address to God. It's a speaking to God. It's a pouring out of the soul to God. Therefore, the tongue, when it comes, is praying or supplicating or interceding or giving thanks. The interpretation, therefore, when it comes, will be in like character. It will be addressing God, praising God, thanking God, supplicating God, interceding with God. These elements are exciting elements of Christian worship. Prevent a worship service from simply being an organized routine that people go through, but are meant to liberate the Spirit in the presence of God. Paul says that with these elements of Christian worship, there is to be a sense of involvement that each one of us has. Each has. The verse 26 begins with, and each of us too have a ministry within this body. 
I re- I, several weeks ago, I had a conversation with a, a family that doesn't uh, attend this church, isn't a part of this church. They were commenting that the church that they had been going to for six years, they were thinking about leaving. And one of the things that brought it to a head was that they realized that in six years of being a part of that church body, they had never called that church their our church. They'd always called it their church. They go away on Sunday and they talk about their church. It wasn't our church. There's only one way I know to make this body feel like you're a part of it and it's part of you, and that is for us to be involved in its ministry and life. The purpose of involvement is that we might strengthen one another, not that we might put on a showcase for our talents, but to strengthen one another. Jeff Moody has a book out called A Drink at Joel's Place, a reference to, I, in the last days I'll pour up my spirit on Paul, all flesh, that's the, the drink at Joel's Place. And he compares the church to a bar. Some may not like this comparison, but allow me to develop it. He says, now, there's a lot in common between a bar and a church because they both advertise something. A bar advertises intoxication and spirits. If you, looking for intoxication and what a bar has to provide, show up at the bar and the bartender says to you when you put your order in, I'm sorry we're out of that, but we have milk today. You might just be a wee bit disappointed and you might suffer that to happen once but if consistently you keep coming and if consistently milk is offered in the place of what you're looking for you will find another place because a bar must provide the intoxication it advertises to stay in business so Jess Moody says the church talks about love the church talks about joy the church talks about building up people and if when people come and see whether or not that's the reality instead of love And joy and building up, they're offered negativity and criticism and tearing down and coldness and the like, then the body of Christ will lose its influence that God has called it to in the world because it will not provide the Christian intoxication it advertises. Oh, what a tremendous challenge to us as a body of people to exist, to not only worship and glorify the Lord, but to strengthen one another and to see all ministry that we give as being for the purpose of strengthening the body of Christ. Well, Paul talks about every member involvement, verse 26. Then he gives some rules governing tongues and prophecy in verses 27 through 33. He says that only one should speak at a time. It's not to be discourtesy. When tongues are given, they must be interpreted. And the assumption is that if a person has a gift of tongues and is not fully confident that there is someone there who has a gift of interpretation or if they themselves are not confident that they will have the interpretation, they are to be still and speak to themselves and to God because it is incumbent upon the gift of tongues to be offered in a public setting with interpretation. He says, thirdly, that tongues and prophecy must be limited to two or three occurrences. That's so there won't be so much that is communicated that people will walk out confused. It's too much information. He says, prophecy must be judged. That is, simply because someone stands up and says, in the name of the Lord I say this, doesn't mean they really have a word from the Lord. It must be judged. How is it judged? I have some simple little rules. Does it magnify Jesus Christ? Does it fulfill the purposes of prophecy, which are to build up, to encourage, and to console? Is it offered in the way that Christ himself would speak? An individual came come to me with an extremely harsh and critical prophecy, and, uh, and not of me personally, but of a situation. And this individual said that this prophecy was from the Lord. It's something in my spirit didn't bear witness to it. And I was just very frank with the individual and said, my spirit does not bear witness to that. My spirit says Jesus Christ wouldn't say it in the way that that's being said. And I said, furthermore, I think it is very easy to cloak gossip and criticism in the spiritual cloak of prophecy. What we can't get away with in gossiping and criticizing, it all of a sudden becomes sanctified if we hollow it with the term prophecy. Does it exalt Christ? Does it build up? Does it encourage? Does it console? Is it true to the Word? Paul further says that long-winded prophets should sit down when another has something to say, something your pastor has never learned. Because if someone sitting nearby gets a revelation, the person speaking should wind down, sit down, so more can participate. It's good for home group meetings when one person may tend to dominate the conversation and they need to yield and let other people participate. Prophetic expression is to be controlled by the prophet. Therefore, the prophet isn't to interrupt someone else and the prophet isn't to go off into some sort of uh, spiritual state of ecstasy that, that has them floating near the top of the ceiling and everybody else on the ground. And peace, not disorder, is to characterize Christian worship. God has not called us to confusion, but to peace. One of the beautiful things that ought to be happening when we gather together for worship, I think is described eloquently by Jacob when he had his experience with God at Bethel. 
he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. That was his initial reaction. I was not aware of it. Then he goes on to say, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now he's saying that not about a church sanctuary, but about meeting God out in an open space in the nighttime sky. Whenever we meet God, it is an awesome moment. Worship ought to lead us into the presence of God. Paul then, thirdly, in today's text, having talked about every member involvement and the use of tongues and prophecy, gives us a little teaching on women's involvement in worship. Verses 34 through 36. A passage of scripture that has been really used badly against Paul and made him appear to be a misogynist, that is a woman hater. And uh, I don't really think that's fair at all to Paul, nor is it fair to the New Testament, nor is it accurately uh, interpretive of what Paul is saying. We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that Paul, in giving directions on Christian worship, has already not only permitted but encouraged women to be involved in the Christian worship service in prayer and prophecy. He has placed one limitation on it, that they should wear a veil. And his limitation was due to a principle, which we looked at at the time, called headship, a recognition of certain governing principles God has put into operation in the human race. I illustrated at that time by this. I said, suppose this morning that I had come to church wearing a baseball cap. And I got up on the platform and I sat here with my suit on and the baseball cap. And I got up and everybody prayed. I kept my baseball cap on. And when it came time to preach, I was still preaching with my baseball cap. Now, I defy you anywhere to say that preachers cannot preach in a baseball cap. Unless you, unless you want to quote that it's a shame for a man to pray with his head covered, uncovered. Well, I don't know. What, what is it? Covered or uncovered? My mind is temporarily blanked out. Why is that wrong? It's wrong because it shows disrespect. In our culture, for a man to wear a hat in a, in a public worship setting is extremely discourteous, disrespectful, and it's denying a principle of respect for authority that we have. I said that if my wife showed up in church wearing a veil, that it would bring me into disrespect. In our culture, it would be doing something against headship. And if she kept on doing it and people got nervous looking at this veiled woman, uh, you know, they'd be guessing, what's wrong with the pastor? You know, is his wife in a, in a tete-a-tete with him or what? And that's... Uh, uh, See, the principle doesn't change headship, respect for the ways God has chosen to order the human race, but the way it culturally translates does change. Now, in respect, therefore, we've said, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, has given women the permission both to pray and prophesy in the church service. What now is he saying, therefore, women keep silence in the church? How can that square with what he said in 1 Corinthians 11? Has he changed his mind? And the answer is no. He hasn't said one thing here, only to change it over there. The insight that I have into this text is from personal experience. It's from being a missionary's kid in the Orient on the border of China and Tibet and being in worship services that I think were very similar to the Corinthians. Women sitting on one side of the church, men sitting on the other. It's the way it was practiced in the Hellenistic world. It's the way I experienced it as a kid in China. In the culture in which I was a missionary's kid, the men, by virtue of the opportunity that culture afforded, were by and large more educated than the women. The women would come and sit on their side and they, during the course of the worship service, would talk about affairs of the week and the interests that they had. If something was said in the service that one of them did not understand and her husband was sitting on the other side, she might call out, Joe, what was meant by that? And that can contribute to disorder. (laughs) It is not nearly so sophisticated as the nudge that wives and husbands are now able to give because they're sitting together. So Paul says, quit having Christian worship in such a disorderly way. Let the women keep silent in the church. That is, let this talking cease that you are allowing and let this calling out in public come to an end, let there be order in the church. And if the Corinthians think that they're uh, uh, priding themselves on being such a spiritually permissive church, Paul says, now wait a minute. He says, you Corinthians have got to quit thinking that the Word of God originated with you. That you have got to avoid the mentality of a church that says, we're the most spiritual church. No, there are some churches that feel that way. We're the most spiritual church in town. We're the most spiritual church in this part of the county. We're the most spiritual church in this state. We're the most spiritual church in the country. Not at all. We're not, this church, I'll speak now for Newport Mesa, is not more spiritual than another church. At least I hope it is not in the sense of looking at ourselves from a standpoint of pride saying, well, we're more spiritual. God forbid. The body of Christ as a whole is meant to be a spiritual organism growing up in tribute to the living Lord. We take our place alongside other church bodies. We thank God for what he's doing among us. We thank God for what he's doing elsewhere. The word of God didn't originate with us. We don't have the freedom to suddenly invent something and say, well, we can get away with this even though it's not condoned in the Word of God because we're something special. We're more spiritual. 
That can't be. So that is corrected in the Corinthian church. Paul closes with a sort of a summary. By channeling spiritual power, verses 37 through 40, he says that all who express a spiritual gift must recognize apostolic authority. That's the key. You know, there are people in the body of Christ today in the charismatic renewal who don't recognize this principle. I've heard people talk on the subject of faith and when it comes to looking at uh, Paul's statements in respect to faith and the thorn in his flesh and the like, I've heard persons actually say, but Paul wasn't well developed in that area. He was a great apostle, but he wasn't really in some areas had a fully sufficient faith. He wasn't fully developed. Therefore, we shouldn't look at him as a, as a pattern. We must realize that God is doing a new thing now in us and we know more now in this area than the apostles did. That's exactly what the Corinthians were doing, denying apostolic authority. These words with which Paul speaks are binding words. They are words given to him as an apostle of Jesus Christ to authoritatively guide the church for all ages and times. And we don't have some fresh word from God that comes along and contradicts that. The gift of prophecy, Paul says, is to be encouraged. And the gift of tongues is not to be banned. It's not to be an order in the church that says no speaking in tongues in a public setting. Rather, when tongues occur, they are to be interpreted and they are to be in order. All must be done with good appearance and order. It must appear seemly. It must be beautiful. It must... It must be pleasing to the, to the Spirit of God and to our spirit as we bear witness. The end result of worship, therefore, is that not only is God glorified, but the church is built up. What is the bottom line of ministry in the church? The bottom line is that the ministry that I have to offer to the body of Christ results in the building up of other people. I gained a beautiful insight into this from the ministry of our Lord. John chapter 17, verse 5. He is completing his earthly ministry. It is the night before his death, the night before Gethsemane, that is Gethsemane night, but before the Gethsemane experience. And Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer in the presence of his disciples. And he says this phrase, Father, glorify thou me with the glory I had with thee before the foundation of the world. So I was reading that one day. Something new struck me that I'd never seen before. And it startled me, it shocked me, and it put me in greater reverence than I'd ever had for Christ. Glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the foundation of the world. What began to strike me about that prayer was that Jesus is at the end of three years of ministry. He's going to the cross for us. And he simply asks that when his mission is all through, that he'll be reinstated to his previous glory. He doesn't ask anything more from the Father for his years of effort living on earth as God in the flesh, our Savior. He doesn't say, give me greater glory than I had with thee before the foundation of the world. He simply says, restore to me the glory I had. And I looked at that and I said, what's Christ get out of the whole incarnation? What's Christ get out of the crucifixion? What's in it for him? In a theological sense, really nothing. In terms of his personal self, he gains nothing. He is the eternal Son of God before he comes, and at the end he's the eternal Son of God again. Nothing less, nothing more. What then, therefore, does he gain? I think he gained two things. He gained scars and he gained us. That's all that's in it for him. Scars in us. And I see in Christ that perfect model of what ministry is to be in the body of Christ. That it's not, what can I get out of it? If you're going to teach a fourth grade Sunday school class and you're looking for reward, hey, you're not going to get paid. A lot of people aren't going to notice you're there. I'll tell you the people who are going to know you're there. The fourth graders. And I hope there'll come a time when 10 or 15 years down the road, one of those Fourth, used to be, fourth graders will come up to you and say, I remember you. You touched my life for Jesus Christ. That's the pay. That's the bottom line. It's building up the body of Christ. So what ministry in the church is all about. It's so easy to put other priorities first. It's so easy to say, but I've got other things to do. But to make a commitment. To say, my function in life, among other functions that I have, is to build up the body of Christ. There may be nothing in it for me. There may be no pay. There may be no recognition. But neither was there for Christ. All there was for Him was scars and people. May it be of us as well that our ministry is given in such a way that the people of Christ whom we love and care for are built up in our faith. Let's look to Him in a word of prayer. Our Lord Jesus, we come to You in this moment with thanksgiving in our heart. You have loved us. You love us now. You will love us always. We praise You. As we come to this communion time and focus in anew on worshiping You, touch our hearts afresh with the reality of Your life, of our future in You, of our redemption. 
And touch our hearts too, Lord, in a way that we'll want to be involved in what You're doing on earth. That we'll not be satisfied to simply stand on the sidelines and watch others minister, but that, Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit would come upon us and show us how we are to be at work and what our faithful responsibility is in the body. Help us, Lord, as an entire church family to really be people who build one another up in the faith and to care enough about one another to take the time to build up. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We ask your presence in a special way now as we celebrate this communion together in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.